Thank you all for joining us this evening for our Kari lecture series. I'm Lindy Crew, Kari's director, and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ian Randall, who is with us on Cyprus as a Kari KAOC fellow, a research visit delayed by the pandemic, but we're very happy that he's finally made it out here to join us. KAOC, the Council of American Overseas Research Centers, is a nonprofit organization that supports its 25 member organizations around the world, including Kari. Each year, they award Kari funds for two US postdoctoral fellows to travel to Cyprus and conduct research, and we're very grateful to have this support. Our seven fellowships of various stages for next year will be open for applications very soon, so take a look on our website and see if you might be eligible. Dr. Randall received his PhD in Archaeology and the Ancient World at Brown University in 2018. His dissertation was entitled Setting an, Ins an Insular Table, Pottery, Identity and Connectivity on Crete and Cyprus at the End of Antiquity. Since this time, he has held posts as visiting or adjunct professor at several US institutions and is currently postdoctoral research fellow with the Database of Religious History at the University of British Columbia. He has been the recipient of several fellowships, including a Kari Graduate Student Fellowship during his PhD studies and a frequent visitor to Kari over the years. Dr. Randall has presented at conferences and written several articles on topics ranging from pottery to religion and urbanism and collapse. He has extensive field experience in Cyprus, Syria, Egypt and Greece, as well as several other countries. His current fieldwork on Cyprus is as pottery analyst for the Korean Urban Space Project, directed by former Kari director Tom Davis, who is with us this evening, and Kari trustee Laura Swantek, who I believe might also be here with us this evening on Zoom. This summer, he also served as survey field director for the Palamas archaeological project in Greece. I would now like to invite Dr. Randall to present his lecture this evening entitled Disaster and Debris, Remaking Society in Post Earthquake Creon. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> this is interesting. I haven't uh, done this in about three years. So, <clears throat> so good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Carrie for the opportunity to open their autumn lecture series. Uh, Carrie has been a home away from home for me ever since I started working in Cyprus. Um, and I found the Cypriot archeological community equally welcoming during that time. So thank you so much. This talk covers some of my recent research at Corian and in the Episcopi Museum. Uh, it's a project that was disrupted by the pandemic but is now getting back on track. Before I talk about earthquakes and Corian, however, I'd like to talk a little bit about hurricanes. Uh, although I have no connection with the one currently bearing my name that just destroyed a good portion of Florida. So on August 29th, 2005, Hurricane Katrina struck the city of New Orleans in the United States, causing devastation across the city and region. Uh, the recovery and cleanup was organized by a series of federal and local officials, as well as by the people of New Orleans itself. These various efforts were often conducted with different priorities in mind. Priorities that threw into stark contrast pre-existing structures of power and inequality. In a recent study of contemporary archeological processes, Shannon Doughty outlined not only the ways in which these priorities shaped the new urban fabric of New Orleans, but also through their very enactment produced new forms of identity and social cohesion. For example, poorer sections of the city were left to languish after the hurricane while more affluent neighborhoods received more immediate federal attention. Moreover, a new dump containing the mass of hurricane debris was located in Lower Nine, a poor, largely immigrant community that, as a result, experienced a sharp uptick in locally driven political activism. Rather than a single event that divided time and society into a before and after, the disaster was constructed from the social fabric that pre-existed it. From an archeological perspective, this provides us with an opportunity. An opportunity to use examples of rebuilding and recovery to see how communities are articulated and how they go about adaptively re-articulating themselves according to cultural logic. 
This taphonomy of disaster, Dottie's term, examines then who is doing the rebuilding, what they are rebuilding, and what they choose to leave fallow. It also covers how people renegotiate their relationship to material culture more generally when things become unavailable. The ability of a system to incorporate these social and physical transformations, adapting itself to both long and short-term conditions has often been described as its resilience. Hurricanes, of course, are just one example of a short-term cataclysmic event, event that leaves an archeological signature. Others include invasions, volcanoes, fires, epidemics, and earthquakes. Before I talk about Byzantine Corian, though, which was largely destroyed in an earthquake at the end of the fourth century, I'd like to discuss why I'm looking at the late Roman period at all. In approaching anthropological questions of social cohesion, power, and identity, it is sometimes easier to examine societies that are far more different from our own than the late Roman Empire. And indeed, this was a preoccupation of much of anthropology during the 20th century. Leaving aside questions of the definition of the modern nation state, the late antique and medieval Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium, can certainly be considered a state level society with a, whoops, with a centralized bureaucracy, uh, a civil service, professional army, and a high level of monetization over most of its history. Moreover, it lasted for 1100 years, an incredibly long time in which to consider issues of identity and cultural continuity. Accepting its longevity, the similarities that can be drawn with our own society make those divergences that can be found even more instructive and any assumption of parity in how systems and people dealt with crises, a lost opportunity. When facing conditions of considerable change, sometimes sudden, people make decisions about their relationship to material culture and each other that are often quite visible in the material record. Byzantium, over its long history, was subject to a considerable number of such sudden changes, including local disasters like the earthquake that destroyed Corium. And it is a rare site indeed in the Eastern Mediterranean that does not show some signs of earthquake damage. Resilience of Byzantine, Byzantine society to earthquakes, particularly its top-down systems of command and control, has recently been anal analyzed by Jordan Pickett and Lee Mordecai and found to be quite strong. This might be surprising given the problems attendant on disaster recovery in late antiquity. There is, for example, the slow communication times and speed of travel. Clay, brick, and stone are notoriously difficult to earthquake proof, with only wood really showing the necessary tensile strength in the face of seismic wave action. Whoops, whoa. I guess I won't rest my hand there. <laughs> um, here we go. Um, in addition to the initial loss of life and structural damage, secondary effects of an earthquake might include famine from disruption to rural infrastructure, disease from destruction of aqueducts and baths to civil unrest following on shortages of food or housing. Moreover, the approach to natural, nat natural disasters in late antiquity can be generally characterized as reactive, uh, much like our own, come to think of it. <clears throat> Um, although some recent arguments have been made that for Hagia Sophia, at least, uh, the mitigation of earthquake damage may have been part of the calculus involved in that monument's construction. What then are some of the ways that Byzantine authorities dealt with disaster, particularly of the seismic variety? The responses available to the central government in Constantinople were limited. Money could be sent, as was done with Antioch following an earthquake in 526 but far more common was tax remission. Salamis Constantia, for example, was granted four years of tax remission following the devastating earthquake of 342. Additionally, engineers or materials could be made available for construction, although these tended to be fairly long-term affairs and centered on either symbolic or large-scale infrastructure projects. This is a far cry from the descriptions found in hagiographies and chronicles, in which emperors are described as rebuilding entire cities. The primary burden fell on local officials. Just who these officials were differs significantly between the earlier and later Roman empires. Prior to Christianization, much of this effort would have been undertaken by the curial class, that is local secular members of so elite society engaged in a competitive dance for influence and power. Later, 
bishops and ecclesiastics take over this role as the curial class largely falls away. And here you can see one of the adaptive responses to disaster that I discussed earlier. In both cases, inscriptions attesting to these local elites and their relief efforts are prevalent in the epigraphic record. Advertising was an important part of this effort for a significant reason, as such recovery operations can usually be seen as being about either maintaining or acquiring influence. In the context of the fourth century, and indeed the 19th through 21st, this could also include conversion. Sometimes these efforts were even collaborative on different scales, with funds being contributed locally and materials and workmen coming from a central government or religious authority. What tended to get rebuilt depended on who was doing the building and of course their priorities. Aqueducts and temples, for example, appear earlier while church complexes and orphanages appear later. Again, these building projects are not as so much sea changes as rearticulations of the physical and social environment that had in many cases been in the works for a while. The disaster merely throws them into stark relief. One might call these events opportunities for renegotiation, both of the social fabric and of the urban landscape. That, however, is a very top-down picture and one that is likely influenced by our history of excavation bias. We might choose to focus on the three old basilica and pass over the slums next door. The question then becomes one of recovery for whom, but also in the case of Corian, when? In examin examining Corian, I want to argue for a different approach, one that takes a more holistic view towards a taphonomy of disaster. This view seeks to take in different segments of society and their material culture, as well as the complexities of per potentially divergent social agendas and processes of community formation. The ancient city of Corian, as you know, occupies a bluff overlooking the sea immediately to the west of the Aquitary Peninsula. While inhabited in one form or another since the Neolithic, the city proper was founded by settlers in the Iron Age and reached its apogee in the Roman period, growing to be one of the largest settlements on the island. By the fourth century CE, it was a thriving city, although it was unfortunately subjected to a series of earthquakes starting in that century that devastated its urban fabric. This was initially recognized by the excavations of Daniel and McFadden in the 1930s before being fully defined by Christou Magaw, and finally Soren's sensational finds at the earthquake house in the 1980s. The last of these quakes, thought by Soren to be that described by Ammianus Marcellinus for 365, but now thought by some to be a few years later, led to a near total destruction. And by the end of the fourth century, the, the site is thought to have been almost totally abandoned. This view is reinforced by the lack of apparent cleanup efforts with several bodies having been found in recent years in the rubble and no apparent attempt to clear or reoccupy large segments of the city. Some decades later, however, the site was re-inhabited and construction began on the large three-aisle basilica that currently dominates the central part of the ruined city. Magaw placed the initial construction of this edifice occupying the footprint of a ruined secular basilica no earlier than 395, but probably sometime between the 410s and 430s based on the numismatic evidence. Although large sections of the city remained ruined and unused, including the theater and the temple to Apollo, a smaller city reoriented around the church took root on the Acropolis and ecclesiastical foundations were established in the later fifth and sixth centuries nearby. This new city had a very different character with spolia heavy in use and none of the previous structures in the, in the Acropolis fully rebuilt or used for their original purpose. This city was to continue until the Arab raids of the mid seventh century and the relocation to Episcopi. In terms of resilience, what had gone wrong? From the perspective of water infrastructure, the city had been well served. Two conduits from the hinterland snaked their way into the city through pipes and tunnels. And the site is dotted with numerous cisterns and reservoirs for imported spring water or rainwater. Including one that we have our, on our site. Um, at uh, Cusp, uh, which Remy the rat used to live in. Every morning he would just go scurrying and jump into the, the cistern. So Remy is missed. Two conduits, um, let's see. Uh, many sections of the pipe network show signs of large scale replacement. 
likely as a result of earlier earthquake action. Stone cut channels with protective covers are in evidence in many places, and there are even terrace walls to prevent damage from landslide or rock falls outside the city. Unfortunately, not enough is currently known about the hinterland of Corian to judge effects of the earthquake on rural infrastructure. And the general consensus is that the earthquake was just too powerful and the damage too extensive to affect repairs to the system that once kept the city alive. The reoccupied city made use of a reduced number of rainwater cisterns, but the extent and complexity of the previous water system remained a thing of the past. With the possible exception of the House of Eustolius. This is a particularly interesting structure and, along with other data, led me to ask a series of questions about the narrative of recovery and reoccupation that I just gave you. Despite the name, the House of Eustolius was not a single residence, but rather an opulent guest house, complete with a small set of baths fed by an intricate system of pipes and cisterns. Replete with mosaics, and sited at the southeastern end of the old city near the theater, it is considered to have been built in the late fourth century, shortly after the earthquake. Although the mosaics bespeak a Christian identity for the patron, according to Mitford, and an inscription references alleviating the suffering of the citizens, it is almost certainly a secular construction. The population towards which it was directed, directed at, is hinted at is hinted by numerous pieces of evidence. In his 1961 report on the clearing of the nearby theater, Stilwell notes that along the back of the structure were found a number of humble dwellings or shops, as he called them, partly located in underground caverns and constructed of spolia and rubble. You can tell from that rather bad photo. Coins from these habitations date to the reigns of Constantius II, uh, 345 to 361, Valens from 372, and Honorius from the year 433. Christou in his 1975 excavations noted several post-earthquake structures in the southeast of the Agora and in the House of the Gladiators, but did not describe them in depth. Soren also speaks of what he calls post-earthquake squatter habitations in the Temple of Apollo and in the southeast of the city in the Baths and in the West Complex. Throughout his excavation, Soren removed the overburden above his earthquake levels mechanically and did not record them, um, noting frequent instances of post-earthquake contamination and the post-earthquake dumping of ambiguous ceramics. Uh, Parks' excavations at the Amethyst Gate Cemetery also seem to show continuous use, although there is a distinct shift from chamber tombs to presumably Christian cyst graves. A taphonomy of disaster for a fourth century Corian then begins to look a, a far more complicated than it at first appeared. Are the Basilica and the House of Eustolius competitive foundations or do they represent different levels of governmental recovery efforts at different times? Towards which communities are they directed? The situation of the Basilica on the footprint of its secular predecessor may in this sense be more symbolic than convenient as well as its heavy use of pagan spolia. If there is a significant community at uh, Corian post-earthquake, but pre-Basilica, what are their efforts at adjusting to these new conditions? How do we factor them into a consideration of urban resilience? Undoubtedly, the city's population was under considerable social stress, but to posit a cesura based on top-down rebuilding efforts is to miss the opportunity to examine the processes of recovery and adaptation at all levels of society that usually follow short-term cataclysmic events. As the ceramicist for the Korean Urban Space Project, I have sought to place the information from our excavations on the edge of the bluff in conversation with that from earlier projects on the Acropolis to gain a better understanding of this post-earthquake situation and by extension, the social fabric of Korean at a time of illuminating stress. To this end, I sought and received the very kind permission of the Department of Antiquities to examine the material from the 1930s and 40s excavations by McFadden and Daniel at the House of Eustolius in the theater, um, the which has occupied my last few weeks. After I discussed the findings of our excavations near Soren's earthquake house through the lens of a taphonomy of disaster, I'll talk about some of my tentative conclusions and continuing questions after looking at the theater and Eustolius material in the storerooms in Episcopi. Over the last 10 years at Corian, minus a COVID hiatus, 
we have been excavating in a large elite residence or public structure on the southern side of the site along the bluff and next door to Soren's 1980s excavations that he dubbed the earthquake house. Now on this map, it's just about where the words Roman house are located and I've placed a small red box. Based on the pottery and other recent finds, such as this rather lovely piece that came up this year, we have been able to date the main structure to the second century CE. By the fourth century, the building appears to have been subdivided with interior wall construction and refuse pointing to perhaps not as affluent residence as it had previously enjoyed. And here you can see one of those interior walls, which you'll note is quite different from the one it's abutting. Uh, and here, um, proximity to the earthquake house and the public market, both of which had also been subdivided by the fourth century, the former containing a stable and the latter private dwellings, also point to this portion of the city as being not the most up and coming. This is further reinforced by the fact that neither our building nor the earthquake house were cleared of debris or human remains following the seismic event at the end of the fourth century. Having the opportunity to finally look over the pottery more generally alongside our bulk removal this season, I was able to identify up to four distinct episodes of dumping in our excavation area. This material is primarily from the end of the fourth century with small quantities of earlier intrusive material that may indicate scraping or clearing in other areas. The presence of coinage and high quality items, such as this glass millefiori plate from Egypt, may also indicate what manner of areas the material was being cleared from. The dump immediately next to our excavated structure also contained high percentages of red slip fineware from this period. Many of the sherds in the cusp dumps were relatively large fragments with no signs of repair or reuse, which may be an indication of no lasting disruption to the supply chain immediately after the earthquake or also of attendant class associations. So I thought that was rather interesting and spoke about the priorities of uh, a post-earthquake Corian. Less affluent areas are not being cleared and indeed are being used for dumping, possibly from more well-off well -off parts of town. The main urban basilica, as mentioned, is constructed some, some years after the earthquake on the footprint of the old secular basilica and reusing much of its building material. Possibly a symbolic gesture, this sought to reorient the Acropolis around a new urban core, even as Christou's excavations point to tantalizing evidence of squatter habitation in the vicinity. To try and gain an understanding of how this dynamic worked alongside our material from CUSP, I've been looking at the material from two other major buildings on the eastern side of the Acropolis, the theater and the house of Eustolius. Oops. Um, only partially published, the material from these early 20th century excavations has proven more difficult to grasp, not least because the tags were written on wood in pencil, um, but some tentative findings do suggest themselves. The theater, which as Stillwell mentioned, showed significant signs of humble dwellings around the time of the earthquake, as indicated by the coinage, produced a lot of fourth and early fifth century pottery. Much like the upper levels of dumping in the cusp building, this pottery has shown occasional signs of early intrusions. And actually the bits I showed here there have a number of second century and Hellenistic inclusions in them. That one in particular. Uh, Mav um, Mavromatis in his 2009 dis dissertation and following on from the work of Lamota and Schiffer in the American Southwest and Manning and Routman on Cyprus, looked at the average ratios of fineware, tableware, amphorae and cooking pots in fill, household debris and other primary and secondary disposal contexts. Some of the material from the theater seems to roughly match the rage ratios for fill, which provides for a complicated picture in any taphonomy of disaster particularly given its proximity to the ameliorative house of Eustolius. The material from the bath complex and guest house are of a somewhat different character. Here we see larger sherds and a generally higher concentration of fine wares with lower numbers of pithoi or storage vessel fragments. This material also seems to go considerably later than that in the theater or in the cusp area. And this is a bad picture to have up for that, but We'll get to that in a second. Um, 
I'm still trying to determine what context extend into the pre-construction period for the House of Eustolius. McFadden stated that the earlier phases also indicate a sense of wealth, but much like our building over the bluff, money doesn't last forever. And I need to know if this remained the case immediately prior to the earthquake. So let's go back to that. All of this is to say that I'm still coming to grips with the taphonomy of disaster for post-earthquake Corian. In particular, I want to try and outline the relationship between the Basilica and the House of Eustolius and their relative placement vis-a-vis -vis the poorer sections of the city in cleanup and recovery efforts. Both the Basilica and the House of Eustolius are institutions aimed at providing services to citizens under considerable stress. If they were meant to form the core of a new urban area, with an audience of primarily lower class individuals. That has important implications for processes such as Christianization and late antique urban transformations, in which part the, in which part the earthquake played no small role. I've also begun examining the dump material in the cusp area for indications of use wear and shifts in form availability to see if any significant changes in consumption occurred in the post-earthquake city. Consumption practices are vital to the approach I've taken to taphonomies of disaster at Koran. At the core of this research are questions of identity construction and community formation. That is, how does the reconfiguration of local space, which includes access to goods and services, create, reinforce, or disrupt social cohesion? Back to this one, which will make sense in a second. Moving from larger issues of settlement and architecture to the smaller scale of individual objects, the ways that we engage with material culture shape not only our consumption, but our understanding of self or who we purport to be in relation to others, which then further shapes our consumption, etc. This is one of the main engines that drives culture change. How do we incorporate Chinese food or Scandinavian furniture into a sense of who we are? What is the context in which we make use of one thing and not another? If, for example, I drink beer out of a stein or a plastic cup, I am sending very different messages about what kind of a person I am, both to myself and to others. The mediation that things provide in social relations is also related to issues of post-colonialism and class, in the sense that issues of power are deeply embedded in questions about the reception, rejection, and recontextualization of new forms of material culture. Not unlike how power dictated the resettlement and cleanup at New Orleans, and the subsequent rearticulation of social cohesion. This was at the core of my dissertation research, which began by looking at the period of the Arab raids on Cyprus in the seventh century. It is this additional disaster which affected Corian that I would also like to bring into conversation with the fourth century earthquake to further examine comparative structures of disaster response, not just at the local level, but also at a higher structural level. My focus on the material culture associated with dining is at a much more advanced stage for the seventh century than for the fourth, but it provides a roadmap for considering issues of value and identity articulation during moments of crisis, like post-earthquake Corian. If we look at the contextual situation of ceramics, that is the ways that they acquire value through consumption, we should be able to understand shifts in the way that people conceptualize their identity via the mediation those ceramics performed in the very social act of cooking and dining. In choosing to look at the seventh century and Cyprus, I highlighted this relationship at an important moment of transition when people largely couldn't get the things they were used to using for building their food oriented object worlds. Following the Arab conquest of Syria and Egypt in the 630s, Cyprus went from being a node of commerce and communication in the essentially Byzantine lake of the Eastern Mediterranean to a threatened border area on a maritime frontier. Cyprus was attacked in 649 and again in 653 before a treaty was signed in 688 between the Byzantine Empire and the Umayyad Caliphate, which designated Cyprus a demilitarized zone, which, along with Armenia, would pay taxes to both empires, but be apparently safe from attack. This treaty was ostensibly to hold with the occasional abrogation until the reconquest of the island by Byzantium in 965, although the written sources we possess don't discuss from whom exactly the island was reconquered, which is an interesting point. In any case, this situation of the island politically between the Byzantine Empire and the Umayyad Caliphate makes it an important case in which to consider material culture change 
and value-oriented identity processes among Cypriots at a time of increased social ambiguity and stress. Across the Eastern Mediterranean in these centuries, which are seen as the transition from late antiquity to the early Middle Ages, there is a significant shift in material culture. Many of the earlier Roman forms of ceramics, which had endured for centuries, disappear over the course of the seventh century. And it is only in the last decade or so that forms from the eighth and early ninth centuries have begun to be identified. Glazed wares from both Byzantium and the Caliphate are well known from the 10th and 11th centuries on, and in some cases earlier, but for many decades, there was a considerable lacuna in our knowledge of ceramics. The traditional narrative for Cyprus, because of the poorly understood archeological material, has described the island as largely backward in these centuries, economically depressed, and with little going on in the way of urban development or exploitation of the countryside. Indeed, most cities appeared to have been abandoned with new centers largely unknown or with what is generally described as squatter habitation continuing in some places. Here we can see the similarity with the post-earthquake situation at Kurion. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence though, and this narrative has been con contested in recent years. In my research on the seventh century, I focused on the following questions. What types of rest ceramics were traveling to the island and what was being made locally? How do they change over time? In what context were these dining and cooking wares being consumed? And how do those forms compare with the connectivity expressed in transport ceramics? In essence, I was trying to get at the choices being made in production and consumption during this period. After the raids, when the island was neither part of the Byzantine Empire nor within the Caliphate, even if either empire could at various points claim nominal possession. At a smaller scale, and this included the material at Corium, I wanted to see how people were eating and cooking. Did the attendant ceramic material being used have more similarities with those in areas within the Caliphate or the empire? How exactly were imports being used compared to local products? What might, not, what might that mean given their origin and their context of consumption? This would be the beginnings of an approach to questions of value and processes of identity formation as they related to food and dining culture. Finally, by comparing the island with the mainland, I could start to ask questions about the role of island geography and connectivity on these processes. This is where the material from the fourth century comes into the picture, where I'm beginning to use a similar approach, starting with issues of contextual consumption. Shared material culture on the micro or macro level is indicative of common practices of consumption and provides a way to start talking about identity in the Byzantine Empire of the fourth or the seventh centuries as it is just these types of common practices that often form the basis for internal ideas of group cohesion. I drink beer out of a plastic cup and my neighbor does the same. Perhaps that says something about who we are together. Any identity associations may be unconscious to the participants, but certain contexts may throw such similarities into sharp distinction, such as an encounter with beer drinking Stein people in an informal setting. In any case, much of the discussions that have prevailed in the scholarship around Byzantine notions of identity have often revolved around elite texts on the continuity of ancient Greek, lit Greek literature and culture rather than shared material practices. As this baseline of ceramic similarity changed in the late seventh century, as the supply chain experienced difficulties, the group identities that may have been linked to common dining and cooking habits likely changed with them. That supply chain breakdown is largely considered to be the result of tensions between the Byzantine Empire and the new Arab Caliphate, including the raids. The grain ship stopped, as it is thought did much state subsidized shipping. These are the, the Anona shipments from Egypt. While debate has raged over the extent to which market forces dictated the movement of goods in the late antique Mediterranean, it cannot be denied that by the late seventh century, the wide distribution of red slipped dining wares had largely, largely ceased. Trade generally collapsed into regional systems and potting traditions and consumption practices took on new, far more localized forms. This much is fairly well known, although as mentioned, it is only recently that these local ceramic trajectories have begun to be plotted and understood. By the late eighth and early ninth centuries, a recovery and resumption of connectivity between various areas occurs but by then the ceramic picture in the Eastern Mediterranean had changed completely. 
The question then becomes, in addition to issues of cleanup and urban re reorientation, how do consumption practices change following large-scale catastrophes like seismic, seismic events or invasions? What effect does this have on contextual consumption and group cohesion? Following the disruptions of the seventh century, one of the only imported finewares of the new glazed variety to appear at, on Cyprus is glazed whiteware from Constantinople. This is a very unfortunate picture of these. The presence of this ceramic alongside the overall picture of intensely local forms of ceramic consumption might indicate an increased class-based differentiation in some forms of dining, dining practice in the seventh and eighth centuries. Obviously, the rich have always dined richer in antiquity, often with metallic vessels, but the extension of this to ceramic forms, the breakdown in regional connectivity, and the emergence of distinctly regional traditions of pottery points to the beginnings of a horizontal as well as a vertical social differentiation along the borders of the empire. This is all the more interesting when held up against administrative changes taking place within the empire at this time. In the course of the seventh century, as Byzantium weathered the crisis produced by the Islamic conquests, it streamlined and centralized its administration. In the provinces, local elites were largely replaced in their duties by Constantinopolitan bureaucrats. Moreover, Constantinople took on a singular religious importance with the growth in power of the patriarchate and the eclipse of some earlier urban and ecclesiastical centers. The performative aspect of eating off of a Constantinopolitan dish when the rest of the island's inhabitants uh, were turning towards locally innovated, pro innovated products or attempts at a conservative maintenance of older forms of dining practice and material culture could signal a distinct shift in some identity processes associated with ceramic consumption and the respective value attached to these material markers in relation to group identification. It is just such shifts that I'm looking for in the consumption practices of reoriented urban populations at Corian following the fourth century earthquake. Comparing these two episodes to look at processes of social cohesion following disaster has of course important resonance for the present. How are our own object worlds changing as a result of COVID? Or our sense of identity based on shared material experiences? How are class issues exacerbated by all of this? What does a breakdown in connectivity do to a sense of local identity? And how are we to rebuild and reconstitute our society now that the structures of power and exploitation are more evident than they perhaps ever were before? The archeology span of late antique and early medieval Cyprus can help us here. It has things to say about how these processes work and what the follow on effects may be. As we consume and connect in the shadow of war, COVID and the climate crisis, we need to think about how we want our sense of community and class to change going forward and how our shared material experiences and the lessons that can be drawn from the past affect that dynamic. Thank you. <laughs>